Hey, hey, welcome back to Turnmark Time, episode 24, 24, 24, 24, 24, 22, 24, 24. I'm the turn. I'm the bark. And we're still going to be here a long time. So as you can tell behind us, this is a four content video. This is part two of uh, lesson 20 on African Americans in the mid 1800s. So uh, we talked about it last week. We kind of went over the trials and tribulations of slavery. This is going to give you a more uh, look at, at the resistance to slavery along with culture that's developed um, from African Americans at this time. And we're both going to go on record as saying the book does not give you enough detail. Like you, you really should go dig and, and find out more information. We're going to try and insert some stories uh, and things like that that'll help. But uh, basically, I guess we'll do. You, I, I feel like we shouldn't start off with resistance. I feel like we should start off with like the maybe like the family life stuff. And then go into resistance at the end because I feel like that's a bigger topic to talk that's about. That, do it. Does that work? Yeah. So, um, I guess talking about it, one of the things like, you know, people, family units, if you talk about like sociology, like people always live in family units. Family units can look different. Um, like in American society, it's very uh, paternal. Yeah, that's the right word. So, like, women take the the man's name when they get married. You, you know, you take your dad's name when you're born, your dad's last name, all that stuff. Where, like, if you think about, like, uh, people who are traditional or, right, really traditional Jewish people, right, you take the mother's name or that's, everything's, I don't know if the names are that way, but the, a lot more of their culture is maternal. Yeah, matriarchal society. Yeah, it's matriarchal. Uh, so, like, if you're, your mom's a Jew, you're a Jew, right? Is that the way? I believe so, yes. Okay. So we're not we're not experts on Judaism, um, so please don't uh, lambast us in the comments. But uh, you know, and there's other cultures where like other tribes around the world where they essentially like every kid is a child of the of the group of the tribe, and so like every woman is your mom, every man is your dad, you know. And then here in the West, we we kind of have like that it takes the village to raise a child kind of mentality, mm -hmm. where. You know, I, I had a fake grandparents growing up, family that was really close to my dad's that we were pr pretty much considered family, even though we had no marital or blood tie to them. Um, a lot of people actually thought that we were related because of the how close our families were. But anyway, slaves try and do that. The problem is, is that they don't have any legal right to form because like a marriage, while a lot of people think about it, it's in a church, it's a religious thing. It is also a legal contract, and in the same way that, like, your dog can't go back to the dog analogy, right? Your dog can't get married and then claim, like, their puppies. Yeah. People can, like, sell their puppies. Um, one of the traditions that kind of arose out of that, or there's some argument about this. It comes from it comes from West Africa, so it actually predates slavery. Yeah. You know, and when people would get married in West African cultures, they would jump over a stick or some sort of symbol signifying that, like, the two of them were entering into a new relationship or a new you – know, that was their home. They were jumping into their new home. Mm -hmm. Kind of if you go back and think about, like, the myth of Romulus and Remus where right. they draw the lines on the ground and say, these are our cities. And then, you know, Rom or Remus jumps over Romulus's line and then Romulus kills Remus. That's yeah. why we have Rome instead of Remulus. And, yeah. That's why it's Rome instead of Reem. Um, well, right? Sorry. Yep. Oh, you're right. Uh, you're right. When well, you're right, you're right. Yeah, when you're right, right. you're right. <laughs> um, you know, so, I mean, people would do these kind of informal marriages. But like we said last week, that, that there was no legal protection. Like, you could be bought and sold. You could be separated from your wife or your children, if that matter. So, I mean... Family is very important, though, and even, like, kind of this, I would think that, like, people even start, like, taking care of each other, you know. At a certain point, there's a little bit of, like, I would say in the beginning, there's probably some, like, I'm out for me, mm -hmm. you know, individual kind of, like, striving forward. And then you realize that there is some comfort in the people that are there stuck in bondage with, you know, the people around you. Yep. 
And I would say, like, one of the biggest things. So, first off, double checking it, uh, at least from what I found on a quick search, it, Judaism does have a matriarchal society, meaning you trace lineage through the mother's side. Uh, secondly, the when we talk about this, right, like, one of the things that's unique is actually um, growing up, if you were a younger child, so let's say, I would say, like, between, like, the age that, like, toddlers, like, can run around and stuff like that, it was pretty normal for slave children to be playing with the plantation children and run around and be friends, right, and and do that. Um, a couple of things. One, this uh, teaches your slaves English fairly easily because, uh, right, to play with the children, they're going to have to know the language to kind of share um, and, and have that. It's going to build it. But secondly, it's because this is just gives that, again, plantations themselves are self-sufficient, so you're not going to have a lot of children running around playing together and things like that. And then obviously when you hit an age where white children are going to be, go to a tutor and slave children are going to go to work. Um, but again, raising children is very difficult. It's like uh, you said, where it's going to be a village mentality. So the older slaves who can't necessarily work are going to rear children and, and do those types of things. Um, and then uh, the, the other mentality is there's a, there's a real fear right here. Like the most, I think what a slave fear is most um, isn't like death or punishment. It's the idea of your family being sold off, right? Like it's the idea of, of being sold off and you might know what plantation they're going to, but you'll still never see them again. So. Yeah. And they talked about kind of like social things like they would do corn husking or uh, pea Peabody. shelling together. You know what I mean? So like kind of communal, like food prep. And then as well as like quilting bees coming together to whatever fabric they can get to kind of in a you know socialistic way to like provide yeah. the most means for as many of them as possible. Yeah. Um, and then it talks about making improvised musical instruments from whatever they had available. You know, right. they could use bones to create rhythm or put a piece of like skin over uh, wood to make like a tambourine, you know, kind of sends echoes of the idea of the canjo yeah it's can a banjo in a can it's a canjo if you haven't heard barker plays canjo you need to hear it so uh, one of the things uh that's big too is we were actually i'm trying to remember i don't think you weren't with me when we did the the native or we did the the slave uprising thing in virginia i think that was i think that was the last year i went no, I th we didn't do that one. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, so there was really cool. It was this. It was this African couple that tells the story of like a slave uprising, which we're gonna get to later. But one of the things was was drums, and drums were like that's a traditional African instrument, right? Gets brought the concept gets brought over. They try and make drums and things like that. And drums were used to like signal things. And so at that point, right when they did the slave rebellion with drums. They actually take away all the Africans, like, or slaves' musical instruments in terms of, like, the drums because that had signaled the slave uprising and been a, had been a huge problem. And so uh, that's where we see a shift into Native Americans – or Native Americans. Wow, I have a brain fart. We see slaves shifting to using their voices um, and, and singing. And that's where you get, like, spirituals and things like that. Um, which are going to be the rhythm and things like that are going to be the basis that will eventually develop into like rap culture and things like that. Um, along with like, I always talk about the scene that they do. Well, and this is another topic that relates to like church, right? Like if you, one of my favorite scenes from Forrest Gump is when, you know, Lieutenant Dan basically says, uh, uh, well, where's this God of yours at? And so he, uh, he so Forrest Gump goes, uh, so I went to church every Sunday, and I sang in the choir. And Lieutenant Dan will come tonight. But he's singing like a gospel-y type music where everyone sings together, which, again, when you're working in the fields in the hot sun, right, that could be a little bit of relief. Um, and then what I also thought was cool was that singing could be used to pass messages and things like that. Like, I remember, um, oh, shucks, what was it? It had to have been sixth grade when we were doing our civil rights assembly but i remember there was a song that we got to sing and i still sing it to myself whenever i'm walking by myself um like in the woods or something like that but it was called follow the drinking gourd 
And if you look up in the sky, probably not right now because we had like thunderstorms and stuff pass over. But the the drinking gourd was the the Big Dipper, because if you go to the handle of the Big Dipper, the very last star, and you go up, you can see the North Star. And so obviously North Star points to North, which was a point to freedom, right? But it was always follow the drinking gourd for the old man is a waiting for to carry you to freedom. Follow the drinking gourd. And so I always was like, it, it stuck with me. And I'll sit there and sing that to myself over and over. But it was all these, it was a secret. How do I say this? Overseers thought it was just a song to get them through it. But it was actually secret directions on how to navigate uh, a bunch of safe houses and get up to there. And the old man is waiting to carry you freedom. Is, is There's a guy named Peg Leg Joe that would carry slaves across the Ohio River. And, of course, once you got across the Ohio, you were in the north, which meant you were you were free um, from slavery. So, yeah. And they also talk about in the book that that jazz and blues. Yes. Um, is an infusion of, you know, of African elements of music mixing with American ones or more European elements. You know, and this, this is something that I always talk about. Um, you guys are students love to listen to banda music from Mexico. And uh, when, when banda music starts, it's it's because I'm a nerd and I get bored and I want to know where things come from. Um, banda music is actually a mixture of like, you know, Spanish, native Mexican music and German influence, which is why if you ever hear banda, it always starts with a really big, either like a baritone or like a tuba, kind of a bump, 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 you know, and we live pretty close to Leavenworth. So it's kind of ironic that you have you know, you can go up there and listen to the um ba ba um ba ba um ba ba, yeah. and then you listen to this banda music that's coming out of Mexico, and there's a lot of similar themes in it, and it's because there were German people who moved to Mexico, you know, and had this crazy like you know musical love baby called banda, yeah, you know, which is why banda is different than like you know than cumbia and other you know styles of Latin music. So yeah, sure, this would be great. <laughs> insert mr gordon um yeah. drop some knowledge yeah but uh and that's and that's the thing is like gordon knows if you ever want to know about music guys you should just shoot an email to mr gordon because we were coming back from a seahawks game one time and he literally laid out the entire history of hip-hop and rap for me and i thought it was the coolest thing he's like i'm sorry if i'm boring i was like you're not this is fascinating like keep telling me so um one of the big things here like we were talking about like the gospel things i was talking about the forest Gump. Uh, there's actually slave churches um, because, again, the idea is that if you are a slave and you, you know, follow Christianity, you'll be saved, right? And it's interesting because I think the book does a good job of this. They're like white preachers in the area are very much like you got to obey your master, right? Because if you don't obey your master, then your heavenly master will get mad. And slaves, according to them, according to the textbook, they're like, slaves weren't buying that. They weren't like, that makes no sense. But they would have these like secret churches, these invisible churches where they would basically go off like into the woods or like a cabin or like somewhere at night where they could meet. And they focused actually more on, and again, I want to stress that I am not preaching religion to anybody, but I just am telling you what, how they did it. Uh, they would focus on like uh, the books of like Exodus and like Moses focusing on like how he got the, uh, the Jews out of slavery in Egypt and, you know, led them those types of things. So a lot of that that belief and those focus points were on um, other like groups that had to deal with slavery. So like white people would be preaching this one thing, but then the slaves, right, obviously they get to the point where they can understand the stories that are passed down and they focus on the ones where slaves get freed, where the whites are like, hey, this is, you you obey us, you're going to do fine in the next life. So well, if you think I, about I, it. Hold uh, on, I'm going to jump off camera really quick. Just, I have to let my dog outside. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, keep going. While he's doing that, I will have a conversation with you. Um, it's kind of similar that the Catholic churches preached a very similar kind of like follow directions and you'll get your reward later kind of a mentality, be a good servant to the to the poor people or the serfs in the Middle Ages who didn't have a lot of freedom. They weren't slaves, but they couldn't travel freely and all of those things. But again, the message was like essentially like, you know, know, know your role, stay in your lane and yeah. you'll get your you'll get your cookie later. 
right? Even if now is not so great. But yeah, I mean, the slaves aren't stupid. Like they're gonna look at it and go, but wait a minute, in this book it says like you should love your neighbor like you, you know, love yourself. You should treat strangers with kindness, the story of the Good Samaritan. Um, slavery was bad for the Jews. Why is it not bad for us? You know, which is again why they will be like, we need to stop teaching them to read. Uh, so that you can limit the amount of information that they have so they can't see those kind of uh, hip hypocrisies, right. you know, in the in the dogma that's being put before them. Right. And so uh, I think it's time to, to kind of make a jump to the resistance part, and then we'll finish with culture. Is that cool? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So resistance. So there are two types of resistance that the book defines, and I, I agree with this, this um, viewpoint of it that there was what we call passive resistance. So these are gonna be like sneaky things, not as obvious, right, that they go out and do. And then you're gonna have open resistance, which is gonna be like things that are visible, you can see, like everybody knows they're, they're doing this. Um, so one of the biggest like passive things that they could do is they would do things like destroy like crops while they were like picking a plant, right? Like they would break it off, make it so it wouldn't grow. They would, um, other, other things slaves could do is they would like um, burn down like property and stuff like that. But like at night where it wasn't like bluntly obvious who did it, it's easy to blame on, you know, a lantern falling over or something like that. And it actually gets so bad with that kind of stuff that I was in the book it says like ins the uh, southern farmers couldn't get insurance because it was just like you it's just gonna burn down like we're not gonna bother with this the book also talks about that the slaves like since they knew that the perception of their owners was that you know africans were inferior so they would play up to that and be like well oh you need to give me directions multiple times or or i'm not quite sure how to do that can you show me how this works you know kind of things like that that you purposely slow down work. Um, and even even today in some businesses, like if the people working in a factory are unhappy with the management, they can do work slowdowns where they're technically doing their job, but they're not doing their job as quickly or expeditiously as they could. They're doing it at a, at a purposely slower rate, right. you know, but they're still technically doing their job. And I think the slaves play that play that line really well where they're like we need to do enough where we can kind of you know be defiant but not so defiant that we get punished right and so like I, again there's going to be um there there were actually some that were a little bit more extreme like there was there were times that, like if you were a house servant you might like do something to the person's food right and, and even to the point of poisoning them um uh, and just trying to do anything that you could do, um, you know, that would damage. Uh, and and then open defiance is where it, it starts to get more violent. This is like the stuff that, that more people hear about. So like open defiance would be like running away, right? And like there are plenty of stories of running away and stuff like that. Uh, Harriet Tubman is an excellent example. Um, I think Barker's going to throw up a picture of her probably. Uh, there we go. And so she is supposed to go on the $20 bill this year. We'll see if that happens or not. Um, With a mask. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just not going to have a mask. Yeah. She, uh, <laughs> she, uh, but anyway, so she, uh, she basically starts, she doesn't start the Underground Railroad, but she's one of the most famous conductors of it. Uh, and a conductor is somebody either like a uh, escaped slave or a free African American person or a sympathetic uh, white person that's going to try and get slaves to freedom. And she, I think she ventures back into the South like 20 some times. And she herself was a slave and escaped freedom and then goes back 20 more times. And she, I think she brings out, the book says around 300 people. Uh, men, women, and children, stuff like that. What's cool is if you watch America, the story of us, when they talk about her, like you get a little bit more detail and she like would threaten to kill people who were like, I can't make this anymore. Like, I'm not going to run away. And she'd be like, okay, well, you're either running away or I'm going to kill you because I'm not giving up all the safe houses and hiding spots that, that we do. 
Um, and then like babies, right? Like people would run away with their babies. Well, babies cry and right. And you got to be quiet. So she would like give them opium and like cover their mouths. And they'd be like, what? And they'd be like really quiet as they got through. So she had a bunch of ways, but what was cool is, and there's a quote, it's, uh, Al Sharpton gives a quote that basically is like the symbol of her is what they feared. And that was more important than the 300 people she saved. Right. Like her, her, the possibility of her being around. And again, as an African, right, you could slip into slavery like pretty easily. Like you could slip into slave quarters and nobody would really notice. Right. Especially on a large plantation with hundreds of slaves. You could just slip into a group and be like, hey. And that's where like the drinking gourd song would come in. Like slaves would come in and, or former slaves or free Negroes would come in and they would sing, like teach the Africans the song. And then they would sing it, you know, and then they'd move on to the next plantation, the next one, and so on and so forth. Uh, you want to talk about that map? I like that map. Yeah, so this is a map of the Underground Railroad. The, the red arrows kind of show different routes that people would take to um, escape slavery and get to the north. So if you, if you can see, let me see which, yeah, that's the one I need. Right here, this is the Mississippi River, so people could travel by water, um, which is actually really efficient, really Again, and up to the Mississippi, and then it's going to go the left fork. I'm trying to think about where the, the one to the west is the Mississippi, and then the fork that goes kind of back down to the east is the Ohio. And then you have an overland route over that away, um, and then again another sea route. But the one you can't see, you got to go this way. Is that you can also go down south to Mexico? Yeah. Because. Keep in mind that Mexico will have, will outlaw slavery in the 1820s. Yeah, 1820s. 1821, I think. It's here 21 or 24. But um, pretty early on in Mexico's history, they say slavery is no good. And they get rid of slavery. And that's one of the re – remember, that's what caused tension between them and Texas was the idea that there could not – there shouldn't be slaves in Texas. So that would be an interesting thing to research and to look at because I don't think that story has been written a whole lot, but, yeah. but we have a, form, we have a former student with that story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, I mean, I don't, yeah, there was, yeah. Mexico has slave ex slaves that will form Afro Mexican communities where it's for former slaves living in Mexico. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's a movie coming out. It's, I think you can rent it on Amazon that's about Harriet Tubman. It's called Harriet. It's got yeah. Leslie Odom Jr. in it, who yeah. played Aaron Burr in Hamilton. Right uh, right. Hashtag not a sponsor. But uh, we like good things. Uh, 1829, by the way, we were both wrong. Oh. So. Uh, but yeah, so like that's one of the ways they run away. But there's another super cool story about slaves getting away. And that is Henry Box Brown. And uh, his middle name wasn't Box, but that's his, his story goes with it. And I actually first heard about this uh, on a Kevin Hart, um, like history of, of African-Americans on Netflix. And I was like, no way, I have to like look this guy up. And so it's basically this guy named Henry Brown who works at a tobacco factory. His master lets him out to a tobacco factory and he lets him rent a house. To, and, and he can have his wife and children there. Um, and he's paying, like, along with, like, the to obviously working any extra money he gets, he's paying the landowner, the plantation owner, to not sell his wife and kids. But the wife and kids get sold anyway. And so he's kind of like, ah, what do I do? And he meets with this free African-American and a, a sympathetic shoemaker, a white shoemaker, and they basically concoct this plan that he's going to mail himself to the Pennsylvania or it's the Philadelphia Anti-Slavery Society. And there's this new uh, fast freight system. So he basically nails himself inside a box that is lined with like uh, wool or like wool and like cheap fabric. He's got a couple of biscuits and a small amount of water and there's one hole drilled in the box. And it specifically says on the box like this side up so he's not upside down. And it says handle with care. And so he gets, he mails himself and, and starts the process and he travels by uh, railroad, then by steamship, 
then by railroad again, and then by road, and he gets delivered to this Quaker pastor's house after being in this box, which, by the way, the box, I think, was was three feet by two and a half feet by two feet. And so, yeah, so he's scrunched in this little box, and they open him up, and it's 27 hours that he spent in that box, right, crumpled up like that. But he mailed himself to freedom. Never complain about Coach again. Nope, ever, ever. No <laughs> such thing as leg room problems. Well, that worked out well for him. Yeah, yeah, it did. And he became a he became a prominent speaker for a little bit. Um, again, and that's the cool thing with like Frederick Douglass and things like that. These former slaves start to have a voice and really start telling people in the North, like this is what it's like, right? Like you know, it's it's bad, but this is really what it's like. Like this is what's going on. There are other open defiant things. There are like slave rebellions that are none of them are actually successful in terms of. Like in the United States, there's one on, is it Haiti that is successful yeah. against France? Um, so that one's a successful rebellion. But like there's Nat Turner and no relation. I've, I've looked, I've tried. It's just, you know, we, I have no relation. Turner's a popular last name. But he leads a full scale rebellion um, and for two days straight just runs around and anybody who's white, he kills them uh and i mean it's it's not it's not good um but what this does is it starts a pattern of white people and and governments in the south constricting what slaves can and cannot do and again like i said taking away like things like musical instruments and uh and you know no longer teach them to read and write and those things like become massive implements of the south because they just cannot have a slave rebellion there are too many slaves and too few white people to, to make it work. Well, and it's important to note that like in the Nat Turner Rebellion that they they couldn't get access to firearms. So yeah. the weapons that they use are, like you can see in the picture above my head, he's got a knife, a really big, not quite a buoy knife, but a pretty big, darn big knife. Um, but they use farming implements as their weapons of choice, you know, in the uprising. And in a lot of these communities in the South that are, when you're on a plantation, a large scale plantation, there are probably more slaves than there are owners. And so you kind of, you 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 think about, you know, like a movie like Ants, you know, or, or what is it? No, Bugs Life, Bugs, Bugs Life, what I want. Sorry, not hashtag, right. gotta be Disney. Um, hashtag also not a sponsor, but... Uh, uh, in a bug's life, right, the ants rise up against the grasshoppers because there's more ants than there are grasshoppers. It's just one of those things where they have to flip that switch. And that's one of the things that the the plantation owners will become afraid of is this idea that, well, if they all got together and, like, communicated, we're in trouble, which is why they're going to take away those musical instruments and why they're going to restrict travel and things of that nature is that that way the slaves can't organize. Yep. So... Again, uh, they, so neither of them are, are successful, but the idea still sits in, in slaveholders' minds. Uh, last thing we're going to talk about is African-American culture that comes from this time period. Um, and one of the things that happens is we see a, a real, like we talked about earlier, you talked about Bonda music, was the combination of like these African ideals with like Americanized things or the Southernized things, uh, I, other ideals that, that mix. And so, like, one of the things is, like, songs, right? Like, spiritual rhythms, things like that. Um, dancing, right? And then I'll let you talk about the last one, the, the stories, so. <laughs> you just assumed that I had that, like, in my pocket? I saw that slide earlier. <laughs> oh, okay. One of the last things they talk about is this idea of um, kind of, like, folk tales and legends coming from Africa and then, like, kind of being, like, Americanized. And one of the ones that I know from my own childhood is uh, the idea of, of, of Br'er Rabbit. Yep. Um, so I'll give you a picture here. Oh, no, that's not the right one. That's not the right one either. Where did I put it? There, it's probably the one that's called Br'er Rabbit. Yeah. Um, so if you're not familiar, because maybe you didn't see this, um, Br'er Rabbit is like kind of like this trickster – and he's always trying to outsmart Br'er Fox and Br'er Bear, who you can see right behind my head 
And in this story, Br'er Fox decides that they're going to teach Rabbit a lesson by making a baby out of tar. Um, and so they put this big blob of tar out there and no matter, like as much as, it's kind of about, like not being prideful, I think is the kind of the moral of the story because Br'er Rabbit gets in a fight and like tries to like punch Tar Baby for not like listening and ignoring him. And then he gets stuck and then he tries to like kick him and then he gets even more stuck, you know, and then Br'er Fox is going to eat him. And then Br'er Rabbit's like, oh, please don't throw me in the briar patch. And which is exactly what he wants, because that's where he, right. Br'er is a shorter version of the word briar. And if you don't know what briars are because you live in eastern Washington, go to the western side of the state, go to a clear cut in the woods. And the first thing that grows after you cut down all the big trees is briars. blackberries, briars. And that's what a briar patch is. It's, it's sticker bushes. Yeah. I mean, those are the things that we called them growing up. It was either, we called them sticker bushes. We call them sticker bushes, too, yeah. yeah. But I think down south, maybe they call them briars. Yeah. And well, this was part of, the original stories came out. He was more of a anthropomorphic, more like Peter Cottontail. Yeah. You know, imagine a, a, a bunny rabbit in a waistcoat, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, this is a version, as you can see, by Walt Disney. Walt Disney took the Br'er Rabbit stories, rolled them up with a uh, a little boy during the Reconstruction era. They made a movie called Song of the South. Miss Holmes has a copy of it. I don't know where she got it, but she has a copy of it. And it is one of the probably like – well, put it this way. Disney has never released it on VHS or DVD. Yeah. Because it's, it's so controversial. It's not on D- – It's and it's not on Disney+. Plus. It like, is not. It's on. It is on Disney like minus. Yeah, it's 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 considered one of the most racist like films that Disney has ever released. Also, though, fun facts, and I don't know if you're getting to this. It Briar Rabbit was also turned into a ride at Disneyland and Disney World. Yeah, uh, which would be Splash Mountain. Yep. Which, if you've been, you would know that. But if you hadn't, now you know. But uh, one of the reasons that Song of the South was so lampooned was. In it, there's a little, essentially a little white boy who goes to visit his grandma who lives on a plantation during Reconstruction. And there's an old, like, kind of ex-slave that still works and lives on a cabin next to the plantation named Uncle Remus. And Uncle Remus would teach little Johnny, I believe his name was Johnny, um, would teach little Johnny stories, the Br'er Rabbit stories, to, like, teach him not to be, like, a jerk. Yeah. Hashtag DBJ, don't be a jerk. Yeah. Right? And people got mad because it's like essentially it was like talking about how how happy Uncle Remus was to live there and work there and be around the kid's grandma. And they're like, you're making slavery sound like it's some like sunshine and rainbows where everybody's riding unicorns and giving hugs instead of this very brutal exploitation of people of color. And a a very iconic zippity doodah. I love that song, too. It's it's a great musical number that comes from this movie that Disney doesn't. Mm-hmm. put out like you know i mean it, it's kind of a negative thing that comes out of it but like, and people lampoon disney all the time for racist things in it they also look at the way that they had uncle remus speak yeah you know they had him speak in like like slave talk where they don't pronounce pronouncing pronounce words correctly and if you look in section 10 there is frederick douglas gives a there's a song yeah. and it says we raised uh we de gib us de corn, we bake the bread, they give us the crust. We sift the meal, they give us the hus. We peel the meat, they give us the skin. You know what I mean? And and that's the way they take us in. Is I guess it's kind of like almost like pre ebonics, but it, it's playing back to the idea that again, these people are given exposure to the English language. But they're not taught to be fluent and to be. Well, I mean, you're not teaching. You want to teach them so they can communicate with you, so that you can like direct them. But and it kind of goes back to like maybe this potential like they don't want to sound like they have a come. They might not want to let you like let on what their entire grasp of the language is. So sometimes they might like when they're playing dumb, they speak in this way, and you can kind of still see that like today in like rap culture where instead of using like R's. For certain words, uh, like gangster, yeah, it's, it's gangsta, 
Yeah. You know what I mean? Where it has kind of that, you, you purposely mispronounce something to give it a certain flavor. Yeah. It makes me think of, we just watched Little Rascals and there's uh-huh, where every time you ask him, he says uh-huh. And then at the end of the movie, they're like, uh-huh knows another word. Yeah. And then he launches into this. I actually have a quite ex- extensive vocabulary yeah. and a very, you know, and a, you know, and a great grasp of syntax and you know, superlatives. I just have choose not to use it. <laughs> and it's just like for a lot of slaves, I, you know, I mean, that was true as well. Like yeah. they would, it's one of those things. It kind of goes back to that kind of the Japanese American adage, the Japanese that old, um, oh. That belief that you know the nail that stands up is the one that get hammered down. Yeah. You want to be you want to be smart enough to be a to be useful and to be important enough to like not get rid of or be treated poorly, but you don't want to get to the point where you're so smart that they want to punish you because they're afraid of like what do you know? And if you want again go back to Twelve Years a Slave, there's yeah numerous numerous examples of that where at one point one of his one of the people who gets custody of him or owns him says well I, I can tell by what you know i know you're not a slave you're yeah. too educated to actually have been a slave but i'm not gonna let you be free yeah. because you do work for me right now yeah exactly you know what i mean so it, it, it gets back into that like really kind of like how weird it is like for us to look back at it and go how could you do that and still think of yours, like go to bed at night and be think like, I'm a good person. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. So that's our last like section on, on slavery and stuff like that. Um, and we have not decided on a shenanigans for this week. So you're just going to have to be surprised on Thursday when we record. So, um, anything else, Mark? Uh, no, make sure you're doing work. Yeah. Right? Starting to, you only have this week and two more weeks yeah. when this drops. Yeah. Three weeks, guys, like to finish, you know, your your academic you guys, season. Yeah. And determine whether you get the the A or the I. Yep. You don't want the I. You don't have to deal with it. So just, yeah. just get it done. So all right. Until next time. On the turn. I'm Bart. And we're going to be here a long time. Have a good night, everybody. Be safe. And be well.